Stephen Wilson is the lead singer, guitarist, songwriter, and founding member of the band Porcupine Tree. He's also an acclaimed solo artist, in addition to being a great engineer, producer, and mixer. Many of people have asked me to have Steven on the channel. I'm a huge fan, but before we get started, don't forget to like and hit the subscribe button. Here's my interview. So I became aware of your music with Porcupine Tree actually back in probably 2005 with the Dead Wing record. One of my friends played it for me, actually my assistant, Ken, um, was like, you gotta check out this record, it's amazing. And and not only are the songs great, but it sounds phenomenal. Can you talk about your background with, with, with record production? When I fell in love with music, I was very young and I fell in love with music via my, as many people do, via my parents' record collection. And I was very lucky because my my dad loved conceptual rock music. Um, you know, he didn't go massively deep, but the few records he had were things like Dark Side of the Moon or Tubular Bells. And also my parents had those classic Donna Summer, Giorgio Moroda, uh, late 70s records, which in themselves are very conceptual. I mean, it's like long pieces which go off in very unexpected directions. Um, there's that sense of journey about them and i think you know very early on that was what appealed to me as a very young kid you know i was probably not even you know into double figures you know i was listening to records hearing records by proxy you know because my parents were listening to these records so eight nine years old i'm being brainwashed by this um <laughs> you know quite sophisticated music i mean yeah. Uh, you know, as I say, I was very lucky in that respect. My parents had quite sophisticated taste. There was never of any Beatles albums in the in the house, for example. So I grew up completely ignorant of the Beatles. But they had things okay. like they had things like Electric Light Orchestra albums and Frank Sinatra albums, and so all of these, you know, very um, I thought beautiful, sonically beautiful. I mean, I wasn't thinking in those terms at the time, but. They're all, they all have one thing, one thing in common. Sonically, they have a degree of excellence. Uh, the Saturday Night yes. Fever soundtrack is another one that was always in the house, always being played. You listen to the production on that record now and, it, and it's, it's just awesome, you know. So yeah. I grew up um, very much surrounded by these, these beautifully recorded records and really fell in love with the notion of making records rather than being a musician. I, I wanted to be an auteur. I wanted to be this, you know, I would look at electric light orchestra albums and I would read Jeff Lynn, producer, writer, guitar player. Vocalist. I'm like, I want to be that guy. He does everything, you know? Um, and very often what's interesting about those guys, the producers or the auteurs is they're not always the best musician in the room. And quite often, they're right. the worst. They're the worst right. musician in the room. Um, they surround themselves with fantastic musicians, and they're like the guys having the ideas, the captain of the ship, if you like. So I think very early on, I fell in love with the idea of being Jeff Lynne or being Roger Waters or, you know, or I mean, I was also a big movie fan as a teenager. So I love that idea of the director, the auteur, you know, the Stanley Kubrick or the, the Bergman or whoever, or the Fellini, these people that just had this vision and had all of these people running around, you know, creating, helping them to create their vision. But everything was stamped through with their identity and their personality. And I think still to this day, those are the records I love the most. And those are the records I try to make. I've never been trained as a producer or an engineer or a mixer. I've learned by my mistakes and I've learned by listening. And I think that one of the things people ask me a lot, young people ask me a lot, is how should I go about, you know, finding a career in the music industry, being a producer, being a mixer? And my answer is always listen. Listen to as many records as you can and listen to music you don't necessarily have an affinity with as much as the music you do have an affinity with, because there's always something to learn. I mean, I was fascinated as a kid, you know, as a teenager with going to my local library. I don't know if it was the same in America, but in the, in the 80s, you used to be able to take out records from the library, you know. Oh, yeah. Books. Yeah. 
same. So I discovered, I remember just going down and picking out records, you know, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, that sounds weird. I'll take that home. Philip Glass, that sounds weird. I'll take that home. Anything that looked interesting or strange, um, I would not always like it, but I would be curious enough and fascinated enough in it to try and decode what it was that this music was trying to give the listener. So my message is always the same. I said, just listen, because that's how I've learned to make good sounding records. It's not because I went to school and trained to be an engineer or to understand how a compressor or a reverb or an EQ works. And the truth is I still don't really understand how those things work, but I know how to get the most out of them now just by trial and error, really. If you go back to the early 2000s, did you start making records on tape and then transition to, to working digitally around 2000 or so? Yeah, kind of, but not in the way you would think. Um, I started making records on tape because my dad was an electronic engineer. Again, a very good piece of good, a very good piece of good fortune is my dad was an electronic engineer and he very early on in my life, I mean, I must've been 12 or 13 years old. He built me a little Porter studio. Um, okay. He got, I think he got a, a schematic or something from one of these electronics magazines and he bought the tape head and he bought a cassette machine and he, he put, took the stereo head out and he put this four track head in. And one Christmas he said, here you are, son, here's a, here's a, you're interested in music. Here's I've made you this little Porter studio and it had a little built in mixer four potentiometers that allowed you to change the no EQ or anything like that. But it enabled me to start experimenting with and understanding uh, the concept of, of multi-track recording and overdubbing. So I was doing that very, very, very early on. And I think later on in my, my teens, I transitioned initially to a, a 16 track reel to reel and then very quickly after that to aid at i mean i think it's fair to say i am definitely a product of just about a product of the the computer recording generation because uh, you know by the time i was actually making records i was definitely working with computers i had an atari st um i think i was probably still using some degree of tape at that time but pretty early on i transitioned to to using what was the, the precursor to logic which is what i use now which was called creator notator um right and you know i i think i had just enough understanding of having worked with tape that it was useful to me but i didn't i certainly never made records using tape but it's funny now because a lot of the time i spend remixing albums that were, that were done on tape that were recorded on tape yeah um, right. Four track, right. eight track, 16 track, 24 track. In the case of Tears for Fears, three 24 track machines synced up together, 72 tracks, but still on tape. So again, I'm, I'm learning a lot about how, that whole kind of philosophy of recording on tape that I perhaps didn't learn myself early on in my own career. Um, what do you what do you think about that? What do you like? What do you like about that, or what have you taken away, for example, from mixing Tears for Fears? at seventy two tracks of analog. What 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 is it about that 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 you have learned or taken away from? Well, I think the main thing. I mean, Tears for Fears is is perhaps an anomaly here because it's kind of very much at the cusp of digital recording and analog recording. But if you go back, some of the albums I've mixed from from even going so far back as the late 60s or the early 70s uh, or the late 70s, some of the, the XTC records I did. The, the main yeah. thing you learn is, of course, what every great musician understands is that imperfection is personality. Uh, commit, commit, commit. And a lot of these tracks were not recorded, obviously, to a click track, a tempo track. Right. And that is what makes them exciting. If you listen to a drum, I mean, I mean, I mix a lot of the King Crimson records and Bill Bruford, incredible drummer, but couldn't stay at one tempo to save his life. Um, and that's what makes him amazing. So you have this natural sense of speeding up and slowing down all the time and the band kind of hanging on by their fingertips. And it makes it absolutely thrilling to listen to. And of course, I, th I think I kind of intuitively knew that, but it's when I actually started mixing these records, I'm like, oh yeah, 
That's why that's exciting, because it is slowing down and speeding up naturally. So, I mean, that's just one very small thing. But I mean, there are lots of little lessons like that. I think you learn from from going back and sort of um, I mean, I'm essentially deconstructing and reconstructing these records. I mean, you're doing, these in, you're doing them in 5.1, right? That's how you're doing well, some of the, the mixes? That's what that's where it started. But actually what happened was yep. a lot of the time, the actually my process is always to recreate the stereo as closely as possible before I even think about breaking it out into surround. So what happened was yeah. I was doing, I was recreating these stereo mixes and trying to get as close as I could. I mean, this is what I talk about learning, you know, trying to listen to the signature, even of things like the reverbs they were using. Oh yeah. And now I can yeah. listen to something and say, oh yeah, that's an EMT 140 or, or that's a lexicon 224. And, you know, just learning by listening and understanding that these all, these all, all these units had their own personality. So, my task always is to recreate the stereo as closely as possible. And a lot of the time, the artist and me would sit down and listen to that new stereo and feel like, you know what? This is worth releasing too. There's something about this. It's not like trying to replace the original mix, but there's something yeah. about it that offers an alternate perspective. So certainly with things like XTC, um, uh, yes, um, uh, tears for fears also we've released my new stereos as well so that then becomes the starting point for doing 5.1 but actually it's no longer 5.1 it's all atmos now i did a breakdown of mayor of simpleton a couple of years ago and i got your 5.1 mix at the right. time the pro tools uh version of it and i had to actually put it back into a stereo mix but i heard heard the recreation you did which was very um faithful to the original yes. i'm a huge xdc fan so very faithful to the original i always wanted to ask you about that about the process for how you would start these things out when you pull up these songs for the first time and you're listening to them what is your process for doing them okay you're doing them in atmos now but what do you first do when you get the tracks in so i mean i get raw multi-track files unmixed more multi-track yeah. multi-track files so usually they've been transferred at 96k or 192k very high resolution transfers of the analog tapes done by people that that's all they do they specialize in, right. in doing tape transfers and they do a beautiful job so i get these pristine but unmixed files wave files the first thing I do, honestly, is load everything up and identify what is actually used in the original stereo mix. Because a lot of times I'm getting multiple takes. There are things on the multiple. There are things on the multi tracks that were not included in the final mix. So the artist or the mixing engineer made decisions. Okay, you know what? I'm not going to use that cowbell part that we recorded, uh, or uh, you know, or I'm going to use this vocal take as opposed to that vocal take. So a lot of that is really just detective work constantly it's and it's tedious right it's very tedious well, it's funny that. because people say to me quite a lot of the time i tell them you know i've just remi i've just done van morrison's moon dance for example i was telling my friend i've done that i've just done van morrison's moon dance you say oh my god that must have been such an such an incredible thing to be open those multi-tracks and it is for about <laughs> 10 minutes and then it becomes right. hard work it's really hard work right because you are you, I mean, it's essentially you have to be very, very concentrated and very focused to make sure you hear every little thing in the in the original mix that was done. Oh, that little guitar phrase has just been brought out there by the engineer, and now it's back in the mix again. Yeah. And if you miss any of those yeah. things, the fans will crucify you. And I have sure, and I have missed things like that to my cost. And the fans have the the great the great sort of anecdote I like to tell is how if you get if you go and read if you go and read an amazon review of something that you've you've that i've remixed you'll see comments like he's done an okay job but i noticed that on track four the hi-hat was slightly further over to the left than it was on the original mix one star <laughs> one star disaster <laughs> disaster <laughs> but that's what fans are like that's what fans are like right because that you're you're kind of messing with their memory you know you're messing with their childhood sure. Um, so if yeah. they notice that you've used the wrong take of the backing vocal on chorus three of track five on right. side two, they'll give you one star. You've got everything else perfect, <laughs> but that one. So, so that's what I mean by a lot of detective work. 
so really just identifying what the right takes, what the right elements to use in the mix are. And then the next thing I do is I start to do stereo positioning and level, basic levels and trying to find the right reverbs for, you know, for the tracks in question is, is hard work. And do you have track sheets that go along with these typically? Or Very not? rarely. Um, sometimes nothing um sometimes okay. track sheets that the engineer got bored filling in halfway through the session so it's like <laughs> you know you can see where the drums bass and and you know the, the basic track is but then they haven't bothered to update it when they've been doing the final overdubs very rarely do i get a a pristine you know a perfectly accurate uh track sheet to go on let's say we go back to the early 2000s and the thing that always impressed me, I love your drum sounds, right? You Very natural, really punchy, uh, great snare sounds, always sound like it was, you know, no samples used or anything like that. Whether there was or not, it, they always sounded natural and powerful, right? Great guitar tones, everything well-balanced, beautiful stereo imaging. Um, how do you know what, a great snare sound is for a record like your own records so you know i, I think again it, it's it's really all about that listening i did for the first you know 10 years of, of my music career i was still this i mean you know again it's worth pointing out i grew up in the 80s and i was a massive trevor horn fan i mean i was buying all the records that came out as att yes. if you want to yeah. understand anything about yeah. beautiful recording at least we're using using a combination of electronic and acoustic equipment there's a great starting point. And I say that advisedly because this is obviously the bit that, you know, some of those older records, they're using Hammond organs and things, but they're not using pure electronic sound a lot of the time. So the guys, Trevor Horn and his guys were in corp were in integrating a new generation of sampling technology, synthesizer technology with beautifully recorded acoustic instruments, whether it was drum kits or strings. And I learned so much from listening to guys like Trevor and Steve, Steve Lipson, who did the Propaganda album that came out in the mid 80s. These records, again, I mean, I talk about this thing, Sonic Excellence. Again, these, these albums absolutely fall into that category. They sound absolutely beautiful. And, you know, there's a caveat to all this, which is that sometimes I love records that are horribly recorded, you know. I also grew up loving industrial right. music and listening to throbbing gristle records, which were recorded on, a, you know, a, a bad, you know, out of alignment stereo cassette recorder and loving that lo-fi aesthetic too. And then you get someone like Trent Reznor, who's very good at putting both of those things together, beautifully recorded albums, but taking that lo-fi aesthetic. I mean, I think that's his great innovation in a way is bringing that kind of lo-fi aesthetic into mainstream, beautifully produced records. Um, Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing slightly. So, yeah, I mean, I, I listened to records like that. And what I loved about those records was it was striking a beautiful balance between the organic and the electronic world. And I still love that. And I'm, it's interesting you say, you said, I don't know if you use sampled drums, triggered sound, but I can't hear that you do. Well, I do. But I love the fact you're absolutely right. I try to make sure that you can't hear it. It's the same with tuning. I do use Melodyne, but the moment I think you can hear that I'm using it, I'll back it off, if you know what I mean. I can't stand hearing those yeah. records where it's like Steve Hawking is on no. lead vocals. I can't, I can't stand it. <laughs> right. I can't stand it. Because uh, unless they're right. using it as a deliberate effect, and of course there are, there are examples of that, but where you just know that these people just don't know any better, they've just put Melodyne on 100% and they think that's okay. Um, that's, <laughs> that's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> I, I personally no. can't, I can't stand that. It offends my ears. You know, I like to hear what yes, feels like a I'm natural sure. performance and by all means, you know, use the techniques and, and the tools that are out there, but it's almost like, you know, the moment you can hear that you're using those tools, the magic, the, the spell is broken. At least it is for me. I uh, did a breakdown of um, Kiss from a Rose, uh, mm. a Seal, which is a mm. Trevor Horn production. And um, Seal sent me the tracks that he got from Trevor. And um, when I pulled them up in Pro Tools and I just put everything 
you know, just leveled everything out. There was the mix. Mm. It was the most incredibly well recorded, mm. well, the, the the imaging, everything about it was perfection. Mm. The stems were done perfectly. I had never heard anything like that. And I said to Seal, he said, <laughs> he said to me, he's like, man, I never realized how well recorded yeah. this was. <laughs> And I think it is yeah. so, it's just so genius. Yeah. Trevor Horn is just, and when you hear records that are done like that, that are just beautiful re recording, like, like what you do with your music, I think it's that to me is the ultimate. Yeah. I had the same experience. I've only mixed one record that Trevor did, which is ABC's lexicon of love, which is a very early one in, in his production career. Um, and it, a very similar experience. Yeah. It was like you almost, I mean, I wish everything was like this, it, it, but it is the exception. It right. is absolutely the exception to the rule. Most albums are, yeah. you know, I'm not saying they're badly recorded, but they're certainly not recorded to the extent that you can just literally load in the stems and the mix is there. You have to do a lot of work on them. Um, but this, yeah. but th this, this guy is, is exceptional in that respect. Um, and it's funny, I did, a, I did a session once for Trevor as a guitar player. God knows why he hired me, but he did for a session many, many years ago. And what was really interesting about Trevor, he is, he is old school in the sense that he doesn't touch any equipment himself. He is just listening mm -hmm. and analyzing and commenting. Now, I, I grew up as someone because I'm, you know, part of the, the next generation of producer engineer. I grew up with the notion that there is this kind of very blurred line between the producer, the engineer and the musician, because these days we're all sitting at a laptop or a workstation and we've got a guitar on our knee and a microphone next to us. And we're simultaneously engineer, producer, musician. And I think that's the norm now, at least certainly most people I know are like that. But I think Trevor, Trevor yeah. was one of the last yeah, yeah. generation of old school producers that actually barely touched a piece, of, didn't touch a mixing disc himself at all. He had great assistants that would do that yeah. for him, but he was the one that was listening, analyzing, commenting, suggesting. And I, and I love that because it, what, a, what a joy to be able to just make records by just not having to worry about the technical side at all, just being able to listen. I did a show this past weekend in Chicago and I, I do some song breakdowns and I did a couple Beatles songs and um, some people came, came up to me afterwards and this, and said, I did, um, uh, I'm the walrus. And they said, wow, can't believe how massively big this stuff sounds now, you know, 55 mm -hmm. years later. It, it's, it's incredible to see how well these things hold up. You know, Dark yeah. Side of the Moon. These some, some of these records are just just so. Well and I think done. a lot of that does come from the the limitations. I mean, you have to understand, and I know you do, um, that when you're recording on four channels of tape, you're having to commit to things that you don't have to commit to anymore. So these days, I mean, one of the things I get fed up right. with is I get sometimes I get sent tracks to mix. And it's like the engineer or the band haven't bothered to get a good guitar so tone. So instead, they've just tracked the guitar 10 times. Right. Well, that's going to say, oh, we'll track it 10 times. No. Right. Why don't you just get a good guitar sound to start with? And then you don't need to track it at all. Right. Um, and of course, in, in those days, working on four track, eight track, 16 track. I mean, I've mixed so many records where the drums, like I've done Who's Next recently as well. The drums on that album are very often just yeah. on a mono track, a mono track. They sound right. huge and they sound, yeah. and they sound great. And the mono track is, that's the sound. Okay. I had to add a little bit of reverb to it. Maybe, right. That's it. That's the sound. And you think, well, yeah. okay. They must've spent a long time making sure that it sounded phenomenal because they knew that they would have no recourse to go back and adjust anything later. Now, what do we do these days? We record drums across 30 channels and we don't bother really to make it sound <laughs> as good as it should. At least that's the way I feel. Um, right. So, and I'm guilty of this too, you know, I'm guilty of this too, you know, ending up fixing things in the mix. So there's, I mean, this goes back to your original question about what can you learn from 
you know, analyzing those old, old albums. Well, there's a great example, you know, get a good sound, spend the time getting a great sound, and then you won't have to worry about tarting it up in the mix, you know. Glenn Johns, when, when I, I, saw a, uh, I saw an interview with him and he talked about Mike and Keith Moon's drum kit, all the cymbals, all the toms and everything, and then using just a very simple three or four mic miking system. All the stands are out of the way. He's just getting the thing. And he said, oh, it's really simple to do. Of course, it's not simple to do uh, to, to make sure the balance is right. But the, uh, but the drummers back then knew that they would instinctually know by going back and listening to the playback that they had to balance the, the parts right. on their own. Right. That that was a big part of this. And a lot of the drummers that I talked to, um, I interviewed Bernard Purdy this past weekend and uh, he and I had interviewed him in the past. And we talked about uh, that you had to balance everything in the room. And and a lot of the drummers that I've interviewed that are all older, that that, you know, are 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, years old talked about the importance of that of balancing the right. drum kit in the room because there was not you didn't have indiv individual right. mics on everything that that was an important thing that's why they would hire these session guys to come in because they would right. just naturally do that and you'd get a great drum sound all the hits would be consistent there'd be no you know missed snare hits or anything like that right but nowadays 30 channels of drums. You can go back in, you can replace whatever you need to yeah, you but it's, stuff around. Well, I, you know, good? obviously there are advantages to that, but it, but it does seem to be quality over quant uh, quantity over quality. A lot of the time, none of the mics individually sound that good. Um, you know, when you put them all together, you try and get something that sounds pretty good, but you know, the, the, the other thing I've noticed also about going back to some of these old records, I, I know we're going down the sort of remix rabbit hole here, but hopefully we'll come back to my music in a minute. But um, one of the things I've noticed about these other remixes projects I do is when you load up the drum kits sometimes on an album, say recorded in the early 70s, and you listen to the drums in solo, you're like, that doesn't sound that great, really. And then you put everything else in and it sounds perfect. It sounds exactly what it needs to sound like and of course the the reason for that mm -hmm. is that everyone else has played to everyone else so there's a band playing in a room right. and there's a kind of symbiotic relationship between all of those players so the guitar player has adjusted the amount of drive on his guitar to fit in with the sort of you know the gestalt entity that is the sound of this band so if you start homing in on individual things, as I do, of course, I have to when I'm remixing some of these old records, I think, well, that's not a particularly good bass sound. Uh, that's not a particularly good snare sound. So, you know, and the first thing I'd do if I was recording now is I'd start tweaking with it and putting triggers on it and all that stuff. But, of course, the thing is that it is, it, it, it is the composite thing. It's when, when you put everything together, the drum kit may not be the greatest drum sound in the world, right. but it's the glue that everything else kind of it kind of glues everything else together so there's something about that too you know that it's not always about getting the most impressive sound I mean, you know i remember in some of my early early bands when i was just starting out working with not so great engineers and the hallmark of a not so great engineer for me is that they start in analyzing individual things in the mix and spending an awful lot of time making that thing right. in isolation sound glorious and then wondering why when they put it back in the mix it sounds like shit again and so you know it, <laughs> doing a mix is kind of like a little bit of that pushing things on incrementally in relation to each other not in isolation so again something i think i learned from you know, from listening to those records. I, I mean, I don't think some of those sounds on those Beatles albums are amazing. And I, maybe I'm wrong, you know, I've never analyzed, but I imagine if you listen to Ringo's kick drum, you might think that's not a particularly great kick drum sound. Put it in with the rest of the band. I was listening to Guthrie's solo on the song Regret of yours. Okay, so so you're working with someone like Guthrie. Is Guthrie a session guy to you? Like how, why, how did this, this, how did you and Guthrie get hooked up? And um, tell me about working with players like that with your own music when you're working with people that are kind of 
would you call them session players? Um, it's not a word a session I would have, guy. It's not a word I would have used. I mean, you know, I I I made a couple of records um, five, six, seven years ago. I made a couple of records where I wanted to be like you know, I was saying earlier in earlier on in the conversation. I wanted to be the worst musician in the room. I wanted to harness the power of an incredible mm-hmm. band. That the kind of Zappa thing, you know. Although Zappa himself was an amazing musician, but his thing was he would always have musicians in his bands that were absolutely t- class. And I think I I made a couple of records like that. um, And I really enjoyed making the record. I've I've moved away from that to being more kind of self-sufficient again. But I enjoyed that. And I think part of it was wanting to be, you you ask, it's a very valid question. Do I think of them as session musicians? No, because I want them to contribute and I want them to have ideas and I want them to blow me away and surprise me. Um, And there's no point having someone like Guthrie in your band if you're not in a way going to let them loose, you know? Um, So it's more a question again of steering, you know, just trying to point them in the right, the right direction and just letting them go. Um, I mean, Guthrie is, is extraordinary. I mean, I've never, I I think there's nobody like him, possibly the most gifted. I mean, in my experience, the most gifted guitar player that has ever been, I mean, he's on that level. Just it's insane. I mean, yes. insane. Um, yeah. And I've played with a lot of great guitar players, but Guthrie is just on another level. Um, and, you know, that's not always what I want, but I definitely wanted it on those two records. And some of the solos he played. I think the great right. thing about Guthrie is that he's not, he can shred, but actually... He also has this incredible soul. And I hate shredders. I loathe shredders. I cannot stand the whole phenomenon of shredders. To me, it's like turning music into an Olympic sport. Um, And it doesn't impress Mm -hmm. me and I don't enjoy listening to it. You know, the analogy I always give is if you're, I mean, like we're talking now, we're communicating. And a lot of the communication of my words is not actually my choice of words. It's the way I'm saying them. It's my body language. It's the intonation in my voice. You can't get any of that in if you're shredding. All you can get literally is the information of the note you're playing. So that's like me communicating all my answers to you in this way with no intonation and no communication at all. through. And that's what shredding is to me. But Guthrie isn't that. He's got something else that a lot of shredders don't have. He can do that. He can play. Well, I'll, if, I don't want to interrupt, but he can play phrases that, that he plays beautiful phrases and ideas that suggest other ideas, but he's also the greatest shredder out there yeah. too. That's the funny part of this is that when it comes to that, he's pretty untouchable uh, as a shredder too. But his, what you're talking about, it's his soul, his sense of, yes. Exactly. His melodicism, yes. his phrasing. He he's a beautiful blues player. I mean, he's just but his the way that he plays it, one idea that suggests the next idea that suggests the next idea. He's just uh he's like Completely. Sonny Rollins or Completely. Miles Davis. It's a, or to the extent you know, that a lot of times the solos you hear on the records are the first take. Uh just unbelievable. I mean, there's a, mm-hmm. there's one of my songs called Drive Home that he play, takes an extended solo the last two minutes. It's a very, yeah. it's a very sort of comfortably numb type yeah. trajectory. The song has, and he, and he's, he goes yes. out with this, this incredible solo. Yeah. He picked up a guitar that I'd just been sent over to the studio. Um, and as he started playing that solo, the E string slipped out of the saddle and he couldn't even play that string. <laughs> so it didn't matter. It didn't, didn't matter. matter. He still produced <laughs> one of the most lyrically beautiful and soulful solos I have ever heard in my life. Um, playing an instrument which was, frankly, inadequate for his talents, you know, um, and one string, he couldn't even use one string. It reminds me of that story about Keith Jarrett doing the Colm concert. Do you know that story about how he hated the piano? Yeah. He couldn't. He felt he hated couldn't the play piano. the low yes. register or the high register. So instead, he went out and he played the whole show in the middle register, and he kind of made that work for him. And, of course, it became one of his most celebrated recordings. You know, that whole thing about limitation being the mother of invention. 
And I think that the Jarrett story and Guthrie, yeah. that solo is exactly a good example of that too. Tell me about how your songwriting process has changed over the last 25 years. Has it changed? Do you do things, you know, when you're, you obviously are sitting in your studio there at your house and what, is that where you write? Do you, uh, do you start with a guitar part? Do you start with a drum part or is every song different? What do you do? How do you come up with your ideas, especially things that have, that are not necessarily songs that start with guitar that have, have ambience parts and things like that. So how do you, what do you, so what's your I, process I think the, like? The answer to that question is kind of all of the above, really. Um, I think a song can start from anything, a texture, a sound, a chord, a keyboard, a, a sound, a, a, a groove. But that's a bit of a cop out, that answer. So I'm going to give you another one. Um, these days, I definitely have moved away from the guitar and I'm much more excited about the possibilities of electronic sound. That doesn't mean I'm making electronic music. Mm -hmm. it's certainly become a much bigger part right. of my of my musical palette and i find i'm more likely to be inspired by turning on my profit five and switching on the arpeggiator and messing about with some knobs than i am by sitting with an acoustic guitar on my lap and i think part of that is because i'm so limited as a guitar player i mean listen if i was guthrie govern i'm sure i'd never get bored but i i bore myself with my, with my very limited abilities, I find I'm boring myself with the guitar these days. So I still use the guitar, but it tends to be something that gets added later on as a color rather than the fundamental of a song now, which is much more likely to be keyboards or an electronic sound of some kind. And the other thing that I think has been very much a big shift in my thinking, certainly over the last seven or eight years, is I'm no longer interested in the idea of genre at all. Um, now, I, like a lot of people that have been a musician for a long time, have a, um, a sort of reputation um, in the media, in the fan base that I make a certain kind of music. I'm not in, I'm not even going to say the word, but we know what it is. And I increasingly kick against that. Um, and I'm very excited. The album I'm working on right now, my next solo record, is, is a 64 minute musical journey, which goes through so many different styles. And I think back again to those albums I, I fell in love with. One of the things people sort of never, never really acknowledge about Dark Side of the Moon, for example, is that there is gospel music on that record. There is soul music on that record. There is funk mm -hmm. on that record. There is music concrete on that record. It is a record that exists purely out of yeah. genre, which is why, in a way, it's managed to transcend the genre that a lot of people try and put it in all the time, but it's obviously gone way beyond that notion of genre. Um, and in my own little way, I think I'm excited about making records like, like that now. Okay. Since Atmos is something that you've, you've done some of these Atmos mixes, does this come into your, uh, uh, do you strictly make stereo versions of your own music nowadays, or are you always thinking about this kind of, or are you making two simultaneously different no, in versions back, of songs? It, no, I'm in the back of my mind. It's, it's a very that? good question. In the back of my mind these days, I have to say I am always thinking in terms of spatial audio. Yeah. So it's not only Atmos, of course, there's also 360. There's L Acoustics have their own spatial audio. There's all these spatial audio formats these days. And I, I, I'm fascinated by them. And this album I'm making now is definitely an album I am making for space. Not only, of course, I will make a, as good a stereo mix as I can, but I'm very much conceiving it for playback in spatial audio now you're going to ask me well what does that actually mean what do you actually do that you wouldn't normally do in a stereo uh recording okay so you might track a, an acoustic guitar part four times instead of twice um now i understand this is a contradiction right. to my earlier point about don't track things too much but sometimes when it's a it's a big block of harmonies or a big block of acoustic guitars if you're if you are going for more of a phil specter approach Sometimes it's nice to think in terms of what will be good in surround. So track something four times, uh, track, a, track a backing vocal 
you know, four times rather than twice. And you know, when you get to surround, you get to mix in surround, you're going to be able to create a really impressive, immersive, um, you know, kind of feeling uh, in the music. So I think a lot of that sort of mindset has entered into this record I'm working on now. Yeah. Do you find, do you think that that's the future? Is this surround mixes, uh, you know, what, whatever the, whatever it is, 360 Atmos, whatever the, I mean, is that, is that where we're headed or will there always be just two track, st you know, stereo mixes and the other things? I think we're heading in two directions and they're kind of polar opposites. So my belief is that, that convenience always wins out over quality of experience anyway. So things will increasingly move towards people listening to music on their phone, you know, that, that in mono or sort of, you know, whatever stereo the phone right. can produce. There's no way that that's going to change. YouTube, streaming <laughs> platforms, MP3s. I mean, I would have thought MP3s would have disappeared by now because there's actually no need for them anymore. We, we, you know, we have, we have, we right. have the bandwidth on our Wi-Fi connections. We don't, we, we don't need MP3s and yet seemingly they're as prevalent as they ever were. Um, now I know of course that there is also the alternative, right. there are audio file sites where you can download stereo mixes in 9624 or 19224, but they're very much a niche for real audio files. So I think it's interesting because the, the spatial audio market is growing. Apple, for example, have seen spatial audio streams go from 3% to 13% in the last 12 months. That's incredible. That is incredible. Now, I'm not yeah, sure how many amazing. people actually realize they listen. Some people are listening to stuff by accident, you know, but the bottom line is that, that spatial audio is definitely, <laughs> certainly since Apple have adopted it, has become a big thing. I said to you earlier that no one asks me for 5.1 anymore. That changed almost overnight when Apple adopted Atmos. Everyone suddenly wanted Atmos. And I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's great that there are so many people that are hearing spatial audio. I mean, okay, it's not properly discrete surround in the sense that you are listening to a kind of binaural, you know, mix down of a surround mix. But it does sound good, I have to say. I mean, I've, obviously, I listen to all my all my Atmos mixes. I do go on my phone and hear what they will sound like through the spatial algorithms. It's great. It's definitely, for me, a, a step forward from, you know, regular old stereo. But, of course, there will always be purists that will always just prefer, you know, some people still prefer mono after all, you know. So there you go. Uh, how is your, your mix down, like your room there set for... Like, like what, what is the speaker configuration that you will, when you're doing these, when you're splitting it out into all these different well, channels? Yeah. So my app, I mean, for those that don't know, Atmos is basically endlessly configurable. You create a mix and it should be able to adapt to any speaker configuration. The standard seems to be, certainly in the industry for mixing, seems to be 7.1.4. So that is seven speakers around you in the horizontal plane, the two at the front, the two at the back, the center speaker, which I usually use for, for lead vocal, and then two in the um, in between the front, uh, the sides. And then the point four, two are, are the four elevated speakers. So that's the other thing about Atmos is you're now mixing in the vertical plane as well as the horizontal plane. So you have, you can put sound above the listener. So two in front, and two behind uh, uh, as elevated. When you when you say in front and behind, do you mean uh, in front above and then in back behind? Not directly above, but no. Uh, so you don't have to. I don't have directly below. I mean, you could have a seven point one point six system, and then you might have another pair of speakers pretty much right above you. But I yeah. and I think most people I know that mix in Atmos at the moment, we're using the seven point one point four, which is. So two, two speakers above you, pretty much above your fronts and two pretty much above your, your rear speakers in the, in the back. Yeah. Are there phasing issues with things like this that, uh, that you come into? I've never, I've never experienced. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know where to start with something like that. I don't understand that stuff. If, if it yeah. sounds good, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I, the simple answer to your question is no, I've never come across anything like that. This new record since you're, that you're making now is a conceptual record. Conceptual record involve, would involve, I would think, that you're going to use the latest technology and 
this is going to be a record that's going to have an experience of spatial audio, right? That that's a big part of this. Yes. Yeah, very much. And, you know, and I'm one of the things I'm going to do with my next record is I'm going to hold as many playback sessions as I can, because I think I recognize, okay. I mean, you have to recognize if you're mixing an Atmos that very few people will ever actually get to hear it the way you heard it when you mixed it. Most people don't have a 7.14 system in their front room. So one, right. of the, one of the things you can do that is, that is now part, certainly for me, has become part of the promotional process is to book great playback rooms, whether it's in London, we have Dolby have their cinema down in Soho. There's a great L acoustics room here also in North London, which I think is like an 18.5.12 system. So I'm, I'm booking those rooms and I'm doing as many playback sessions as I can and just sending out invitations to fans, to media, come along and hear this record. Turn your phone off. We're going to turn the lights off and you're going to hear a record the way you used to listen to records, the way that you don't anymore. And I'm the same. You know, I never find myself listening to a record the way I did when I was 15 years old, putting the putting the record on the turntable, turning the lights off, just laying back and listening to because none of us have time to do that anymore. The speed of life, right. such, we just don't have time. But it's great to get people along and literally get them on beanbags or chairs or whatever it is in a great Atmos room or L acoustics room, turn the lights off, tell them to turn off their phones and just take them on a musical journey. If I said to you, okay, you want to listen to something that you come back to all the time, a record that you come back to or a song that's not your own. What's something that you revisit a lot? Is there, are there any records that you revisit? There are. Um, they're not the obvious one. You know, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not really a classic rock canon kind of a guy. Um, I guess mm -hmm. this goes but right back to my childhood. I was always more interested in the failures than I was in the success. I say failures in inverted commas, the ones that the albums that perhaps people would always dismiss from people's back catalog. I would always go and say, Oh, that sounds interesting. Go and search that out. You know, so like my favorite Pink Floyd record was, who was still my favorite band overall, but for sure, was always I'm a Gummer because everyone at school okay. was, would say to me, what a terrible, you know, that record's awful. What are they thinking? I was absolutely fascinated by it. I thought it was extraordinary. I mean, it was like something somewhere between 20th century classical music and music concrete and rock music and just the sense of draw. I just loved it. So anyway, I say that by preamble to what I'm going to tell you is the album I come back to more and more and more again, more so than any other, uh, any other in my collection is a record made in 1972 by Tangerine Dream. And it's called Zeit. And to me, it is the proto ambient record. It was a double record with four sides of me, four pieces of music, one on each side. Nothing happens. Nothing happens on this record. Right. It is. I know that record. I love it. I can never get bored of it. For me, whenever I put it on, it changes the feeling in the room. It's like what I say about ambient music. It's like perfume. It's almost like just creating an atmosphere which changes your relationship to the space you're in. I love this about ambient music. It's why I've always loved pure texture, you know, music, pure ambient music. So this is a record I come back to. I think I listen to it at least once every month, and I've been doing so for the last 40 years. Um, <laughs> the records I come back to as a producer that still dazzle me are probably the ABBA records, as well as, well as things mm -hmm. like Dark Side. I think I don't need to hear Dark Side of the Moon ever again. I've, I've heard it so many times, it's almost like implanted in my brain. It's like a microchip in my brain that just feeds dark side of the main DNA into my creativity. I don't need to hear it, but I come back a lot to, um, to the great ABBA records, because here's an example of a band that were totally committed to um, the power of a perfect piece of pop music, but that strove also Benny and Bjorn strove to make those records sound as good as the Beatles, oh, yeah. the Beatles and Beach Boys records that they adored. And they took it to a whole nother level, I think. And, and I, I just constantly in awe of particularly the last, you know, the second half of, of the ABBA career. When you're working on these 
remix records versus working on your own music? What what takes priority at this point? Like, what are you working on right now? Um, I know you've been out touring. Yeah. And, and uh, yes, that's right. So I just, just so, finished a tour with with Porcupine Tree. We went out we went out on tour for the first time in twelve years. Maybe the last time we'll do yeah. it again. But it was it was a lot of fun. Um, to play the old music and to be a bit nostalgic for once, although we did make a new record too. So right now, I mean, I'm. It's funny because one of the one of the the words that gets thrown at me quite a lot is workaholic. People think I'm a workaholic um, because I seem to be always doing ten things at once. Um, and part of part of the reason they think that is because it's true, but another reason they think. That, <laughs> Another reason, say, right? yeah. Another reason they think that is that I, I think I work very quickly. Um, people, uh, people are amazed how quickly I work when I'm doing things, and part of that is because I, I spent so much time doing it. Now, I think very intuitively, and like I said, I wouldn't, I couldn't, be, I couldn't explain to you how a compressor or a reverb or an EQ works. But if you play me a record by somebody from 50 years ago, 40, 30 years ago, I'll listen to it and I'll say, oh, I know how to get that reverb. And I can do it in about 30 seconds because I've been doing it so much. Right. I don't want it to sound in arrogant in any way. It's And so one of the things I love to do in a way is constantly change it up. And I love to go to the studio one day and say, you know, today I'm going to work on my record. But then tomorrow I might say, okay, now I'm going to go back and work on this, you know, this old, chic record i've been remixing or something um and just that being able to just do different things different days is is part of what makes it interesting in a way um so i don't tend to be someone that focuses the answer to your question rick is i don't tend to be someone that just focuses on one th i have to have all these balls in the air at the same time maybe i have a little bit of you know i'm a bit um hyperactive in that sense Working in digital, you know, working on computers now, since you can just open up a session mm. and you can you can actually go between things, it's actually very different than it was. Yeah. If you were set up to make, you're making a record, making a solo record, making a band record, whatever, producing a record, you know, you tend to stay on these projects till they're mm. finished. Whereas now you can pretty much open up anything and move between things. Oh, I'm going to mix this today that, you know, something that I worked on three weeks ago and you just go one sign time. So actually that's where digital and working, you know, in DAWs makes it a lot easier to do that, to jump around. Agreed. Absolutely. You know, and I'm, I'm an incredible apologist for digital. A lot, a lot of people from my generation, they still, you know, are very much hankering after the analog days. And I love, you know, I, there's certain things I love about analog, but I absolutely love the fact that I'm making music and I'm doing mixes and I'm making records now because I love digital. I absolutely love it. Partly because I'm mm -hmm. not a particularly great musician. So to be able to have the tools to capture <laughs> a not particularly good performance and actually make it sound the way I want, that's great. But not only this, it's also, and this is kind of something you alluded to, I think, in your question or, or the point you made, is that you can work towards a finished record incrementally now over a period right. of time and you can put something away for a month and i do frequently put something away for a month and then come back to it and it's exactly where you left it and hear it with new ears and a new perspective and realize something about it that you could never have realized when you were too close to it so that that ability to be able to make records i mean i've been making this new record um, incrementally over the last two years this new solo record i'm making and this is something else I'm in awe of when I go back and I work on these old records is to realize they made some of these records in three weeks from beginning to end. Right. It's insane. Yeah. And then they would go, right. and then they would go and do a week of, you know, a month of shows and then they'd be back in the studio making their next record. That is insane. to right. me. I think it's insane to everyone. We've, you know, we've, we've got to a point now. I mean, I t I'm telling people that I'm making this new record and they're going, do you ever rest? And I'm like, well, hold on. My last album came out two years ago. And it's, it's amazing right. how people's perspective has, has changed. Because when I was growing right. up, out, you know, in the early 80s, bands would make an album every year without every, every year. year. That's right. And the previous record, that was just, you know, you, you look at Elton John, two records a year. Through, through his imperial face. It's amazing. I met Elton in 
2004, we were working at the same studio and um, he invited me and the band I was working with, who he was a fan of. I was producing this band. He invited us in after our session. So we go into the, into the A studio, the studio here in Atlanta where I live and um, Bernie Toppin was there and his wow. band that he's, you know, yeah, been playing yeah. with forever. Like there. And we, we talked, we talked for about an hour and a half and he's, and I asked him about this and he said, yeah, we would spend two weeks making a record, writing it and recording it. Then go out and tour for six months and come back in and make another, in two weeks, make another it record and go do that. And we just did that for It blows years. my mind. Can you imagine anyone doing, I mean, there probably is someone out there doing that, but, no. but in terms of mainstream artists now, I think there are several reasons why, several reasons why that doesn't happen now. The first reason is that bands are expected to tour for much longer. Um, so right. the world has become a smaller place and touring now pretty much means 12 months of your life if you want to do it properly. And the other reason I think is that the stakes have gone up. When you release a new album now, it's almost like it has to be a hit. It has to be a hit or your career is over. So you spend so much longer second guessing yourself. And I, and I, kind of, I guess in a way I envy those guys working in the early 70s where, you know, it didn't matter if, if one album was an experiment that didn't quite, you know, commercially resonate because the next album was only six months away anyway. And I love that. I, you know, I still maintain that Elton John's run of albums from Elton John through to Blue Moves is the single, and I'm including the Beatles among them. I'm not the biggest Beatles fan, as we've already established. So I'm including the Beatles. Yeah. The Elton run of albums from Elton John through to Blue Moves is the single greatest run in terms of quality that anyone has ever produced. And it blows me. You've got to remember 10 albums and two of them were doubles. I mean, that in itself. Right. Is mine is a mind yeah. fuck, no? I mean, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road and Blue Moves are double albums. That that's yeah. something I could never imagine anyone doing that again. What do you think about the music industry outsourcing the music promotion now to things like TikTok? Do you have a view on on these things? What do you think of things like TikTok, these social media platforms? It, it almost it almost doesn't matter what I think. Um, because it's it's just now become part of what you have to do. You know, I I have to be present on social media. And I've learned, it's interesting, my last record was called The Future Bites, and it was almost like presenting a record the way that um, a, a high sort of high design concept, in, in a form of a high design concept, using social media, in quite a, a deliberately kind of crass way, but in quite a conceptual way, to market something as if it was a product. Um, it came out in the middle of COVID, so it didn't quite work, unfortunately. It wasn't what I think people wanted at that moment. But anyway, it was an interesting concept. And part of that concept was kind of reconciling myself to the fact that this is, this is where we are now. This is where we are. Radio has no influence anymore. TV has relatively no influence. I've lost count of the number of people that have said to me, oh, yeah, we just got our band on Letterman or Jay Leno or whatever it was or Conan O'Brien, and we saw zero uptick in our sales following it. I mean, it's extraordinary. Is it nothing. They see no upswing in their sales at all. And yet if, and yet right. if you get the right TikTok thing going and that something goes viral or it's massive, it's massive. So... I think the answer to your question is I don't know what I think. I'm, you know, I'm 55 years old, so it's obviously not going to be something I'm naturally going to gravitate towards. Um, but I see how my kids do gravitate towards it. I see how they engage with, with pop music. And one of the other things that's been very hard for me to reconcile, but I have had to accept, accept this, is that nowadays things have gone back to being, and maybe you've done some podcasts about this, but things have gone back to being about the song, not the cult of personality. My kids know songs and I'll say to them, they'll say to me, dad, can you put on this song on YouTube? And I'll say, well, who's it by? They have no idea. They don't They care. don't know. Because right. my kids don't the know reason, either. The reason they don't <laughs> care is they have no interest in that artist beyond that one song. 
So the thing that the thing that right. you and I had of having a sort of cult of personality, following a band, being a fan of ABBA or Zappa or Pink Floyd or Elton John or Black Sabbath or whoever it was, knowing the names of the, the members of the band, knowing the discography, understanding tr the trajectory of their career. Oh, then they changed direction and they did that. And that was an experiment. They're not interested in any of that. They just the one song, just the one song. <laughs> And that's really right. hard for me to accept as someone that has grown up in the 80s, loving music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s. I, I thought music was great in the 90s too. It was still about the cult of personality. It was still about almost a, having an allegiance to an artist and following, what are they going to do next? Are they going to surprise me? Going out and buying the record the day it came out, bringing it home and thinking, oh, I'm not sure if I like this, but I'm going to listen to it five more times because I really have respect. Because I bought it. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. And then finally that's, understanding it, you know, and, and a, I, I, I miss all that. And I think kids will never, they'll never have that because that's not the way they engage with music. Is that depressing? Well, it is to me, but of course, you know, the one great thing and the, the thing that we have to acknowledge is good is that music keeps evolving and it keeps changing. It may not be evolving in a way that we personally like, but it is changing. I mean, I've had I've had to yeah. witness the marginalization of rock music in favor of urban music almost completely over the last 20 years. Rock music has been yeah. marginalized by urban music completely. Now, I mean, although I like some urban yeah. music, I feel more of an affinity with rock music. Of course I do. So I may not like that. But I also can acknowledge that there's a lot more exciting stuff going on in urban music than there is in rock music. Sadly, I don't know why rock music has become so stuck in its ways, but it doesn't seem to surprise anymore. And yet there are constantly artists that are doing even the way they promote records. You know, just this thing with urban artists just dropping their album at a day's notice. And I think a lot of rock musicians are still tied to this idea that, oh, you release a single six months before. No. <laughs> if you do that, people will be, they'll have stopped listening by the time you actually drop your record. That's the reality. Well, I think that there's still part of the, you know, if you're on a major label, you know, oh, we got this, we're on the Spotify playlist or something. And there, there's, they're still thinking in that way, the playlisting part of it and, that's like as, as a, another arm of the label or, or that's kind of how promotion is done now. And they still, they're not thinking like people that do urban music are thinking that use social media in a completely different way. And they know how to promote their music. Through it's an incredible media. learning curve. If you've brought up, if, if you've been brought up understanding the, the, the music business works in a particular way, the new model is incredibly hard to get your head around. I mean, I, I you know, when right. I, I, my, I'm now signed to Virgin Records for my solo career. When I signed to Virgin or Caroline, as they were five years ago, the first thing they did was they sent me on a, a Spotify seminar to learn about Spotify because I, I, I really <laughs> didn't understand. You know, there's a whole world relating to Spotify, the way, the way it works, the way there are things that Spotify look at list, their listeners as lean back listeners and lean forward listeners and the vast majority are the lean back listeners these are listeners that put on a playlist called music for coffee break or music for yoga and they don't even know the names of the songs that are in the playlist and yet these songs are racking up millions and millions and millions of of streams and yet no one would buy the record if it came out on physical. No one would buy the record. And there's a whole generation of artists right. that are making a living from being those kind of artists that are getting in all of these, you know, music for insomnia. You know, there's, there's the great irony, music for insomniacs, music that people don't even hear because they're fast asleep. <laughs> yeah. And yet the streams are racking up and racking up millions and millions of them. And th right. this, this is a whole different world and a whole different, you know, philosophy of, of how somebody can make a living from being in the music industry, which I was completely ignorant of until they sent me on this seminar. And I will, I will never completely get it. Of course I won't. I'm not supposed to. I'm not supposed to. I'm 55. I'm not supposed to completely get it. 
But at the same time, in my own little way, I'm trying to think now about how how would someone like me release a record now? And I don't think the answer anymore is to release one song six months before, another song three months before, and another song a week before the album comes out. Because all that happens, the engagement does this. That's all that That's happens. Right. That's right. Doesn't work anymore. Yes. It does not work anymore. <laughs> Steven, this has been really, really fascinating. I encourage everybody that's watching this to go check it. I mean, there's to talk about your career, you have so many solo records. You have your uh, Porcupine Tree records. I mean, there's just so much stuff you've done. You're a producer. You're an engineer. You're a mixer. The, you know, we we couldn't even find the time to talk about all these different things. Is there something you want uh, that you want to say for people to check out? Well, you know, it's, it's a very hard question to answer because I like to think all my albums are different and it very much depends on the agenda of the person that's asking. So I, I would, you know, I would mm -hmm. say if you like old school, progressive there you go i've used the word after all if you like old school progressive rock then go and listen to the albums that guthrie and i made with guthrie and marco which are called the raven that refused to sing and hand cannot erase they're very much in that vein if you like more electronic maybe more radiohead style approach to music my last record the future bites was more like that Elton John was a guest on it as well if you were to to, to bring the conversation back round again to Elton um very graciously, he, he guessed it on that record. Um, if you like music with a slightly more metal edge, that would be my band Porcupine Tree. We, we have a sort of metal element to our to our vocabulary as well. I make ambient music as bass. I mean, it's the point I'm making is it's very hard to. You're incredibly diverse. You're one of the most diverse musicians, um, and I think it's probably because of your. Uh, that you wear all these different hats, you know, as far as beyond being a, a singer songwriter, you're also the, you know, you also work as an, a, a producer and a mixer and things like that. You, you are really, and, and that's, I think reflected in the versatility of your writing be, uh, of all these I different think it's styles partly of music. that, but it's also, you know, something I wrote about in, I, I, I also published a book earlier this year, just to add another thing uh, to my, my list of things I do. Um, I published a book and there's a story in the book I tell about the first day I went to high school or secondary school, as we call it here, I realized there were all these musical tribes. So there was the kids that only listened to what was the new wave of British heavy metal. There were kids that only listened to the new electronic music like Gary Newman. There were the kids that only listened to the mod bands like the who and, 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 and the jam. There were the kids that only listened to the, the, the scar music, like the specials and the madness. And it blew my mind because I loved all of it. And I didn't understand why you couldn't just love it all. And at the same time, I was going, going down to my local right. library, taking out Stockhausen records and Miles Davis records and loving them too. And, and I think that natural curiosity and that inability to recognize the notion of genre has actually been one of my greatest strengths, but also my biggest Achilles heel. Because how do you sell something? This is the industry I'm talking about here now. How do you sell something? And also, how do you keep faith yeah. with a fan base that you're constantly disappointing? I do that all the time. I do it all the time. I, I upset and disappoint my fan base because I, I, you know, like I go off and make a pop record when they're expecting another big conceptual progressive rock masterpiece or whatever. But that's, I love making those records just as much. And, and I think that makes it harder to be um, successful. And the, 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 the best example I can give is Bowie because Bowie through the seventies changed with every record. And he, he paid a price That's for right. that. He was never as successful as a lot of his contemporaries in the 70s, the Elton Johns and those kind of people. He was never as successful. He was only really, people forget, he was only really massively successful when he went pop in the 80s with Let's Dance. Those records in the right. 70s, I mean, records like Heroes yeah. and Low were considered terrible flops by the label. 
Now we think of them as the great masterpieces of this chameleon-like genius that constantly reinvented himself. But my point is, and I'm listen, I'm not comparing myself to Bowie. He's, he's on another level, of course he is. But, but I love the fact that someone like that existed and is the poster child for that idea that you never stand still, you confront the expectations of your audience, you don't cater for them. But you do pay a price for being that kind of person. This is a very long answer to your question about what album I should tell people to go and listen to. I think you just have to go and just listen to a bunch of things and decide what it is you like about what I do, if anything. Stephen, pleasure like talking what? to you today. Look forward to uh, to meeting you in person Absolutely. in the future, I hope. Thank you so much, Rick. Nice to speak to you too.